How you doing? This is Pastor Maxwell of New Beach Grove Baptist Church, and I wanted to invite you out to make sure you come worship with us. We do a lot of things for the community. We do the In Touch basketball program. We take care of the homeless. We teach leadership workshops. We teach real estate classes to make you ready to buy a home. We help you with building up your credit. We do a lot of different things here at New Beach Grove because our vision is to build kingdom-minded people to serve the community. Why don't you come in and check us out? We love you. Hope to see you here. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 16, and it reads, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any, therefore, who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? asked Saul. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but, he, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. What are you talking about, Lord? No, I'm playing. Ananias answered. <laughs> I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Lord, I ask for your power, your grace to reside upon me. Bring my mind into focus and make sure I bring a word for your people. In the name of Jesus, I ask for you to do your thing in your own way. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. I want to speak to you from the subject, an unforgettable encounter, an unforgettable encounter. Um, Gary Habermas was a young doctoral student in Michigan State in the 1970s, struggling with his faith. Like so many young people who grew up in Christian families and eventually leave home and their faith as well, he was definitely think, rethinking what he really believed. It came to the point of announcing to his mother that he may be leaning toward Buddhism. To settle the issue rationally, Gary decided to do his doctoral dissertation on the resurrection of Jesus. He felt that anchoring his faith in the truth of the resurrection would give him the peace and confidence he saw. The chairman of, his doctoral, of the doctoral committee said the topic was fine, but added this, don't come back and tell us the resurrection happened because the Bible tells us so already. Gary's challenge was to demonstrate the reality of the event without exclusively using scripture. He called his approach the minimal facts method. He presented 12 historical facts that validated the core events and people surrounding the most crucial event in, Christian, in the Christian faith, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The results of his research on the resurrection not only literally saved his Christian faith, but Gary Habermas is now considered one of the world's leading experts on the topic. Out of these accepted historical facts, he put forth in his research, let me mention just five. Again, these are things that the majority of skeptical scholars believe to be true. 
So these folk that don't even believe in God, who don't even believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, they believe this. You see, sometimes you got to get practical. Since we took God to court last week, we want to take these jokers to court this week. How about that? Uh, number one, well, first, Jesus actually lived and was Jewish. They believe he actually lived. They claim, uh, the, this claim is only challenged by skeptics who have determined not to disbelieve any facts that would point to the validation, the validity of Christian faith. It's important to remember simply Googling something is not equivalent to actual historical research. In contrast, any serious student of history will concede that Jesus indeed really lived. Probably the most notable skeptic of the New Testament today is Dr. Bart Ehrman, a former Christian who rejects the inspiration of Scripture. Ehrman, as a historian, said the following, even though he don't believe that Scripture is, is validated or Scripture is inspired by God, he said Jesus existed and those vocal persons who deny it do so not because they have considered the evidence with the dispassionate eye of a historian, but because they have some other agenda that this denial serves. Number two, uh, Jesus was executed by crucifixion by Pontius Pilate. The Roman, uh, uh, the Roman official, Josephus, the first century historian, uh, as well as uh, Tacticus, a Roman historian of the early second century, are both key witnesses of the fact uh, the, beyond the testimony of Scripture. These historical references are why even skeptics believe he was crucified. We can establish this fact of history not uh, just as a statement of faith in Scripture. Remember, though, he as a, though we as Christians accept the testimony of Scripture as God's inspired word, we are showing here that the basic facts of the gospel are accessible to those who don't even share the belief. So basically, they believe Jesus lived, right? They believe he was crucified, but some reason they still don't believe he's the son of God. So I'm just, I'm just trying, to help, I'm trying to help the folk that's doubting. Number three, I'm going to walk through this. Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his female followers three days after this crucifixion. Right? They didn't find the body. Now, remember when they buried Jesus, remember they put, they put the big rock in front of it? The big stone, I don't know if y'all remember y'all scripture. They put a big rock in front of it, they put a government seal on it, which means you better not touch this. But when they got there, the tomb was empty. Guards were in front of their guard the tomb. But Jesus was not there. So people believed that he was crucified. They believed that the grave was empty. But for some reason, they still don't believe. Number four, his disciples believed Jesus appeared to them after his death. The followers of Jesus indeed believed Jesus had appeared to them after his crucifixion. Skeptics suggest these were merely hallucinations or visions instead of a real bodily appearances. As some have suggested, vision of people who have died are usually interpreted as seeing the spirit or the ghost of a person, evidence that the person indeed died. So even if they were seeing hallucinations, right, which we know that wasn't true, you ain't going to hallucinate about somebody who ain't dead, right? He dead. They said they saw him. Now, one thing about people then and now when people die, we tend to believe they stay dead. You believe that? Uh, somebody just took a nap for three years, man. They just got out of the grave, man. He was tired. <laughs> I'm just saying. So, so since the resurrection is the foundation of Christianity, our faith is not the product of blind acceptance, but historical reality. The tomb was empty when they went back. They believe, they know he was crucified. Right? So, however, one of the, the key minimal facts I've not mentioned yet is this, Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, number five, was transformed after claiming to see the risen Jesus. Historians of all types acknowledge that Saul, also later known as Paul, was indeed a real person, a highly educated and religiously influential leader. 
Critics can see that Paul did undergo a dramatic transformation and became a follower of Christ. He would eventually write the major letters to the young Christian churches, such as Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, all these different books which are included in the New Testament. So they believe that Saul lived. They believe he was radically transformed. But for some reason, they still don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Oh, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm I'm going to just get into this. I'm, I'm not trying to make you jump in holiday with, because y'all got to cook out tomorrow anyway. Y'all will be all right. If y'all bored today, you'll have fun tomorrow. Now, y'all got communion here, so y'all don't need no communion. No, I was laughing. <laughs> y'all don't need no communion tomorrow. <laughs> now, with this firmly in mind, we want to focus our attention on this man, Saul. Someone who, histori- who history tells us was very real and deeply important to the advancement of the gospel. Saul was no friend to the Christian community, right? In today's context, in context, he'd be considered like a radical terrorist who would stop at nothing to destroy the religion. Because of his prominence in the New Testament, we should examine the impact of Saul's pivotal encounter with the risen Christ. Saul stands out as history's most famous convert to the Christian faith. His encounter with Christ and his subsequent impact on his life deserves a much closer look as we search for parallels that apply to us today. Let's look at Saul. Number one, Saul's encounter with Christ gave him a new life mission. Saul was killing Christians, right? Saul was killing Christians, but when he was converted, he changed. He, he, this dramatic, it, it could be considered the New Testament parallel of, of Moses encountering God at the burning bush in the Old Testament. Moses encountered God as a consuming fire. Paul experienced him as a blinding light. Saul's encounter is also the source of the expression seeing the light. It does change in your ways. The end result of both of these moments was these men being commissioned by God to accomplish his purpose for Moses this, uh, his, his purposes. For Moses, the call was led, uh, was to lead people out of physical bondage and slavery. Paul's mission was to proclaim Christ's message of deliverance from spiritual bondage and oppression. They both were redirected when they had an encounter. See, 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 you might be throwing parties today for the world, but when God converts you, you will probably start throwing gospel concerts. Can I talk to somebody? You, 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 you know what I'm saying? You, 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 you might be organizing uh, 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 dope deals right now, but you, you, you might be organizing evangelistic trips. Come on, somebody. God can convert you and take what you are using for wrong and use it for right. He told Ananias, look here, I need you to go get Saul because I'm going to use him. And I know, I know he was coming there to kill you, but I changed his way. Stop judging, folk, because because you weren't that good either. Oh, come on, somebody. If you can talk or just take a walk down memory lane, you will be able to say that you didn't mess up some ways. I know you married now, girl, but remember when you had love on the two-way street and you lost it on a lonely highway? Don't act. <laughs> Don't act. Don't act like you want to clean up woman and we ain't talking about me. Lost your man to the cleanup woman. You used to be the cleanup woman. <laughs> Anybody see the song without little? They know what they were talking. I just say I don't know what I'm talking about, man. The people, the church is filled with people who found their God-given purpose and destiny when they came to Christ. You don't know who you are until you know Christ. Oh my goodness, some things that you thought you couldn't do and God said, I will do. He said, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. The devil can't stop you. The only person that can stop you is you. Saul was out here killing Christians and now God converted him and changed him. I hope you ain't out here murdering folk, but even if you are, God can change you and clean you up. There is nothing too hard for God. I know you look down on yourself sometimes, but you need to understand that you're fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you and he wants to use you for his benefit. Stop looking down on yourself. We all fall short of the glory of God. Two, 
Saul's encounter with Christ changed his character. Meeting Christ on the road to Damascus not only changed the course of Saul's life, but it changed his character. Before Damascus, Saul was indeed religiously zealous, yet his heart was filled with anger, resentment, and even murder. Y'all do know all church folk don't like you. I would say turn to your neighbor, but they may not like you. I don't know. Some church folk just mean. Come on, they know scripture, but it ain't in their heart. They remember it. They remember the Bible verses, but do they live it? Oh, man, look, look. And now what are they? We can see the trait of, in people who think they are doing God's work by harassing and harming others. It's funny. Folk be coming to me, well, so-and-so be talking about you. Well, I'm like, well, who? And if you don't say a name, it's you and your wife. A taboo to me. They be talking about you, bad. Who? I can't say it. you then. Under me, it ain't gonna say nobody's name. It's you. And you sit up there and let these folk get you all riled up and mad, and you looking for somebody. You start blaming folk, and you oh, it might be that person over there. No, it was the person you was talking to. Everybody that act like they good, not good. We all fall short of the glory of God. Look here, look at what 2 Timothy says, says, teaching the Lord's servant must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of truth. So you got to be nicer when you come to God. You can't get the Vaseline out every time. <laughs> yeah, thug folk, y'all will get it though, y'all Instead of resorting to torture and persecution to get others to change their beliefs, Paul would instead pray, teach, and persuade them by the force of his arguments, even to the point of being tortured and persecuted himself. Look here, look here. He, You're you going to change. Paul wrote this with such passion in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. you a new person. All that stuff you messed up with is erased. You a new person. And even when you fall short of the glory of God, when you fall, get back up, tell God, forgive you, and go back and try to do what God has called you to do. Right? One of the greatest evidences of Christian faith is the collection of stories of, or accounts of people who were radically transformed and now are trophies of grace. Boy, look back over your life. Some people didn't think you were going to be in church. Yeah, I'm going to leave that alone. Number three, Saul's encounter with Christ affected his relationship. In relationships. Encountering Christ can cause relationships to dramatically shift. Saul's companions were baffled by his change, and some of them wanted to kill him. They was giving him all this authority to go kill Christians. Now he want to become one? He was the greatest mess up ever for them. Your greatest weapon has now turned to God for real. Because see, these folk that were paying him were religionists anyway. They was in the synagogue. They, they, they were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They, they knew who God was. In fact, they knew who Jesus was. Remember when they paid uh, uh, Judas to, 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 to betray Jesus and he tried to bring the money back? They said, we don't want that dirty money. They knew who Jesus was. When they came to Jesus in the book of John, if you really read the text, they bowed down and worshiped him before they arrested him because they knew who he was. Some people that know who you are and still kill you. If they kill Jesus, they'll kill you. I'm not saying for real. Some people may try to do it for real, but they'll try to destroy your character. They'll try to mess up your reputation and act like they're doing something right. Some of the people, Paul thought he was doing right when he was Saul. He thought he was supposed to persecute the Christians. And Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? He thought he was doing the right thing. Some people just twisted. Some people just crazy. And they think they're doing God's will. You can't sit up there and keep getting mad. Some people say, why you don't get mad at so-and-so? If I already know that they shady, why am I getting mad every time they do something shady? I'm crazy then. 
If I already know they're going to do it, what am I going to get mad for? I'm going to get mad every week. I might get mad the first time you do something after that. I, don't, I ain't shocked. It'll change your relationships. When, 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 I, when, I, when, I, when I finally, you know, I know it's legal now, but when I finally stop crumbling herbs, People, people didn't want to hang around me, same boat, didn't want to ride me because my music was different. Now, I might have a relapse and get pop every now and then, you know, but. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, they didn't want to ride in the car. I remember one time we were riding, and it was four people in my dude car, and, and, and one person in mine, and then I guess I ain't had the music on he wanted to have on. We stopped, he got another car. And I went home, I was tired anyway. Thank you. I'm just saying, but see, the music that we used to rock to, I wasn't rocking to it. I couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't take all that stuff in all the time. I'm not saying I'm just holy and don't listen to, to some stuff every now and then, but I'm, I just couldn't, I couldn't handle it, saturated by that music all the time, and they didn't want to rob me. Your relationships would change. Some of the people that you cool with today may not be cool with you tomorrow, but the thing about this, I still talk to some of them now, but, 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 but a lot of people have stopped bo being bothered with me because now I was not representing what they wanted me to represent. I remember one time at Georgia Southern when I had stopped getting drunk all the time. <laughs> stopped getting high. You know, these, these, these people have an intervention with me as if I was doing wrong. <laughs> hey, hey, man, hey, man. You ain't throwing no parties no more. I'm like, for real. Man, you know, we, you know, you ain't helping us, you know, you know, do whatever. I ain't gonna incriminate myself. <laughs> they when they got, you know, they the when they got Bill Cosby and all the other folks. I ain't trying to be saying, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right, Kelly, I ain't trying to go nowhere. I mean, I ain't had nobody trapped in the house or nothing, but. <laughs> individual with me as if I, like, as if I, me leaving hell and going to heaven was wrong. Hey, man, you know, you ain't throwing the parties, and you know, so you ain't bringing, you know, the, 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 the females and stuff over here. What, what, what's, what's wrong, man? I, we, we, you all right? <laughs> now, if Christian folk would do intervention like they did for me, <laughs> we have a whole more, a lot of Christians. But anyway, I'm just saying, your relationship changed. The next year, they ain't want to stay with me. I, had, I stayed by myself. Mama felt bad for me, came up there with me. <laughs> Made sure I found my little part because they ain't want to. This joker knows Jesus too much. Well, he killed our college high. <laughs> I'm just saying. Number four. It ain't happened to like the last year, but it was still there, though. I was still there. <laughs> Better late than never. <laughs> number four. <laughs> oh, number four. Saul's encounter with Christ made him willing to suffer for the sake of his faith. He didn't care. He knew he was a chosen instrument. He didn't care when they beat him. He said he counted all joy that he suffered. He didn't care that they were talking about him. People are always telling me, people talk about you all the time. They say you do this just to do this, just to be seen. I don't care what they say. You understand? You do this just to be seen. I wish I would. Like with Maxwell Realty is partnering with, with the people right now. I'm about to rent a house for $500 less than I should. Do you, do you know the real estate me was fighting the pastor me yesterday? I felt schizophrenic. The broken Maxwell was like, all right now, pastor, look here. At least you putting them somewhere. You can't, you know what I'm saying? So the thing about it is you don't care about suffering. You don't care about losing some money here and there. You don't care about your reputation. You don't care what people think about you because you're like, I don't care what people think because they're going to think something anyway. What I do today, if I change to do something else tomorrow, you know, you know, the same. I remember when we, I'm going to just bring up a store, an old store, New Beach Grove at the old place. Some folk was fussing when we was renting the church in Atlanta making money. And then they were like, why don't we sell it? 
And then when we sold it, the same folks that, uh, that was saying we should sell it was like, why we ain't renting it? I'm like, hold on now. Choose one side. You can't fuss about when we rent it and when we sell it. Choose you this day what you going to do. But then when I, I realized right there, people going to fuss anyway. Whatever you do, they going to say you should do something else. Right there in that moment when I stood there in front of the people and the same folk that was fussing about renting it and you, we should sell it and started fussing about why did we sell it, we should rent it, I knew then I don't care about nobody's opinion. Because at the end of the day, whatever you do, if you say nay, they're going to say yay. And if you say yay, they're going to say nay. Nay, whatever I just said, change it up. So stop trying to please everybody. Hey, trying to please everybody for what? People ain't going to like you no way if they don't like you. They done made up their mind. They don't like you. They not going to like you while you're trying to please them. Can I tell you a story about this man named Jesus? He did everything right. Didn't do nothing wrong. Walked on water. Changed water into wine. Healed dead folk. I mean, raised dead folk from the dead. Put on people's ear after they got cut off. Huh? Healed leopards. Lepers healed them. <laughs> Called the lady that was been over 18 years to stand up straight. Healed the lady with the issue of blood. Did all that. And they still killed him. And you wonder why people don't like you. And you trying to please everybody with your yourself. <laughs> that you feeling that. You know, people from the side, we say, bless your little heart. Bless your heart. You trying to make everybody like you. They not. People kept saying, you know, you doing this. You, you, you running for office. You're doing this. And what about when people talk about you? They go to their phone booth again. They don't know how to put their phone booth. <laughs> Superman, what's happening? Is Lois in trouble? That's all got to do. I don't know. got to say I'm on. Got to... Let me stop, man. Number five. Number five. Saul's encounter with Christ caused him to ground his faith in the truth of Scripture, not just personal experience. Just three years after his encounter, Saul personally visited Peter and James and verified the message of the gospel. Eventually, he would talk to John and other apostles as well as those who were eyewitnesses. He would write to the Corinthians the great gospel creed, which he received from the eyewitnesses he spoke to in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, and which historians say would have been constructed no more than two or three years after the resurrection. These statements contain, and the passage emphasized that Christ died and rose again according to the scriptures. There is no other encounter like Saul's in, like Saul's recorded in the New Testament. The impact of his preaching and his works sparked the explosive growth of the Christian church. Ultimately, because they witnessed and believed these certain undeniable events, the believers were willing to lay down their lives because they saw how bold Paul was, because they saw him beaten, because they saw him shipwrecked and get bit by a serpent and still didn't die, because they saw the miracle of him walking by in his shadow, healing the people who were sick, when they saw the handkerchiefs being taken to people and they being delivered, when he saw other people trying to deliver them people from demons, and they said, Jesus we know and Paul we know, but who are you? When they saw the anointing, he walked in. Can I tell you something? Your suffering is so your anointing can be so potent that when you walk in a room, you shift the atmosphere. God is allowing you to go through the hell you're going through right now because you are an instrument for his glory. You are being cut and contoured as a weapon for God. You got fired and laid off so you can get some intestinal fortitude and stand up for God because even though you got laid off, you still eating good. Even though you don't have a job, you still getting taken care of. Then you started realizing that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Father. You show me somebody who's successful. I told you somebody 
who have been through hell. You can't. It takes a special type of person to lead because people are always going to talk about you. And sometimes God allows you to go through it to make sure he makes your skin a little thicker. To make sure you stop being all sensitive about everything all the time. He talking about me. Who cares? They ain't got a heaven or hell to put you in. Boy. See, now we don't need the dramatic experience Paul had. Hopefully we don't have it. You know what I'm saying? Cause I don't know how many times I turn the other cheek. I don't know. You keep hitting me, you know, I'm like, what's it, EPMD? Like a dick gonna smack. You smack me and I'll smack you back. But I'm, I'm trying to be better. <laughs> see, see, he established Saul's. You, you, you put yourself in the place to make a difference in your life. So he, he, he don't, he don't, he, he, he lets you see what Saul went through and what Paul went through uh, because so you can begin to start looking at your life. I don't care how bad you are, God can still use you. Yep. Saul was able to change the world because he not only knew that the historical facts regarding Jesus were true, but he also knew what they meant. This is where we turn to God's word for the answer. Let's go through the scriptures. Let's go through what the scripture says. Number one, the scripture says, Jesus lived the life of perfect obedience to God's law. He, he, he lived perfect. The reason why he was able to usher in grace is because he didn't sin. The weight of the sin is death, which means he never should have died. That's why the devil rose up, I've said it before, in Peter and said, don't go to the cross. And Jesus said, get you behind me, Satan. Why? Because he understood that Jesus didn't die. The only blood that mixes with the baby is the man's blood. And because your dad was a sinner, you were born a sinner. Because his blood mixed with your blood. Your mama's blood doesn't mix with your blood. Your daddy's bloods do. And so at the end of the day, the only bloodline that was mixed in Jesus was, the, was God. And so because God... God is the one that, uh, that, that, put, uh, that, that, that put Jesus in the womb. There was no imperfections in Jesus. He was not born into sin like us. He was born perfect, and he stayed in perfect obedience. So when the devil sent him to the cross, then he ushered in grace because the weight of the sin is death, and he never was supposed to die. So because you killed Jesus, even though he said, you don't kill me, I lay my life down, but because you set up everything, and you were out of order, and you broke the law, uh, the uh, devil, now you've allowed the law to be superseded by grace because you broke the law by sending a righteous, blameless man to the grave. And now if I call on Jesus because he was, he was, he, he died a perfect, even though he was perfect, he died in my place. He lived in my place. He lived the life I'm supposed to live and died the death I'm supposed to die to make sure that if I just call on his name, my God, even though in my sinful nature, he calls me righteous. I know Maxwell not perfect. I know Maxwell messed up. I know Maxwell don't so hallelujah every time you get on Maxwell nerve, but at the end of the day, baby, he calls him righteous. He calls you righteous even though you ain't right, even though you're not holy. God calls you righteous anyway because you're covered with the blood of Jesus. Number two, Jesus' death paid the penalty for sin of the world. I just said all that. <clears throat> but Isaiah says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him with his stripes we're healed. He died for us so we wouldn't have to die. Now, we will die, but we're going to live again. But he, he died the death we should have died. We should have died and went to hell, but because he went to hell for us, even though he... Oh, can you... <clears throat> this is the greatest act of love. He died for us while we were yet sinners and you be worried about gas prices now it's irritating but you will be okay it's irritating it's a trick of the enemy first of all can I tell y'all something about science a fossil fuel is not going to run out it's a fossil fuel if something keeps dying and stuff keeps keep breaking down and decomposing oil will eventually be made <clears throat> but it's always fear 
They have you walking in fear because fear controls you. As soon as they saw you getting used to COVID and walking around without your mask sometimes and you got you start walking in fear. I know the numbers going up, but people still don't think they're going to die. But the minute people start being scared of that, then here come gas prices because they want you to walk in fear. It's the enemy. I don't care who all the Democrat, Republicans, ain't nothing going to be right. As long as kingdom people ain't in there, it's going to be messed up. Kingdom folk, get off your blessed assurance and start doing what you're supposed to do and taking authority where you're supposed to take authority. Huh? Kicking the gates of hell, he ain't talking about hell itself. He talking about kicking in the gates of hell of politics, law, education, things like that. That's where he wants you to be. Because he was wounded for your transgressions anyway. So look at here. Anything the enemy throw at you not going to work. It's not going to work because Jesus has already went through all of it for you. No weapon formed against you going to prosper. We didn't say it wasn't going to form, but it's not going to prosper. It's not going to work. He already paid the price for you. He already died for you so that you can live. He died in our place. He died the death we were supposed to have. He became sin to free us from sin. Number three, Jesus' resurrection proved he indeed was the son of God. The empty tomb and the appearances of Christ after his resurrection demonstrate that he was indeed raised from the dead. He was, he, his resurrection demonstrates conclusively that one, Jesus is who he says he is, the son of God. Two, his words are indeed true. Three, our sins are forgiven. See, I once heard uh, his substitutionary work on the cross explained this way. Christ wrote a check for our forgiveness in his blood at the cross, and, the re and at the resurrection, the check cleared. That, that, that's our old school. See, that, that's old school. <clears throat> he signed it in blood on the cross, but, but when he rose from the dead, the check cleared. Because he went to hell and said, you know what? I done went to hell and I done took on every sin you ever do, every sin you ever done, every sin you will ever walk into. I've already became what it was that you should not become. I became sin for you. I became the inoculation for you. So you don't have to go get a turtle dove. You don't have to go get a partridge. You don't have to go get lambs and bullocks. You don't have to go get pigeons. You don't have to make all these sacrifices related to what it is that you've done. Because if you can just call on Jesus, that's all you need need. You don't need to know all my names, El Shaddai, Elohim, El Elyon. You don't need to know Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom. All you need to know is Jesus because he died for you. Oh, uh, y'all don't hear me. Let me hurry up. Putting these truths together, they form the essence of the gospel, which means good news. It could be summarized this way. God became man in Jesus Christ. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died in our place. Three days later, he rose from the dead, proving he was the son of God and now offers salvation to everyone who repents and believes in him. I want to challenge you to memorize and master this message and be able to confidently communicate it to others by believing this with all your heart. We can be saved and delivered from the power of darkness by communicating it clearly to others. They can be too. I walk in liberation because I know Jesus has already died for me. I know I fall short of the glory of God, but if I try to live my life as perfect as I can, if I do what God tells me to do, and when I fall, if you get up just like David and say, Lord, I sinned against you. Help me do right. Jesus didn't, God didn't look at David because he was perfect and say he was a man after my own heart. David was messed up. David was a sinner. David fell short, but because David understood as long as I go back to my father, tell him what I did wrong. He already know the answer anyway. Let him know I love him. I need you to redeem me. I want to be better. Better. Can you get the shortcomings in my life straight? Give it to God. The question is this. If skeptics know these things are historically true, why don't they believe? Obviously, this inquiry reveals one of the most mysterious 
and misunderstood aspects of our existence. Doubt. In a court of law, the burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt, not possible doubt. That's why guilty folk get off sometimes. Skeptics say things like, isn't it possible that his disciples stole his body and then went out to preach he was been resurrected? It's possible. But let me tell you something. I don't, I might risk, <laughs> would you risk your life for a lie? I ain't going to go up here and risk my life for Jesus and say he rose from the dead as I stole his body. He died. So if I don't go preach him no more because he didn't get up, nobody going to bother me. They're just happy that the religion is dead. But every disciple except John died a tragic death. They were killed because of their belief. How many people out here will go around preaching a lie knowing people shooting at you every day? Why would you risk your life for something that's a lie? It could be possible, but why would I do that? No, you will put yourself on the line for something that's true because you saw God do it. You don't care how crazy people say you are. you like, what in the world was this? People kept asking me one time, how did I solve this situation at the school? And I told the story before, I'm not going to go into the story. And I said, I prayed about it. And they laughed. And I said, why are you laughing? They said, because it's funny. But I saw it and you didn't, right? So at the end of the day, baby, I don't care how crazy it looks. I'm going to tell you that the reason why I'm able to make it out of the things I make it out is because the cost of God. I don't care how many times you doubt that God has existed. I've doubted him myself even in the past when I was going through some hell over on the other street when I got here. I wondered, God, did you really call me? But he told me if I couldn't suffer with him, I couldn't reign with him. Can I talk to you for a minute? If you don't have a cross, you will never get a crown. You better learn how to walk in this suffering and stop doubting. Stop doubting. He said, look here, Deuteronomy Romans 30, 19, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to go through all these doubts at 11. I don't want to do all this right now. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. He said, I put before you blessings and curses. Choose blessings. Moses wanted to make sure you got it right. And Saul, who later um, be, would be known as Paul, said, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So don't worry about how many people doubt Jesus. You just understand you know who he is. Can I tell you something for a while? If, if, if Jesus didn't have all the power, they would not be trying to take his name out of school. If Jesus didn't have all the power, they would not be trying to take his name out of the courtroom. They would not be trying to tell you, don't pray and say his name in the name of Jesus in the courthouse, in the name of Jesus in the city, in the name of Jesus in Congress, in the name of Jesus in the state. They would not I want you, they wouldn't care about it because if the demons understood it was no power, they wouldn't care. But the reason why they don't want you to say Jesus is because they know every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess because they know when you go in the schoolhouse and you just start saying Jesus, those demons have to sit down and they gotta leave. Can I talk to you for a minute? If you just understand how much power the name of Jesus has, I need you to just try it. It's something about that name. It's something about that name. It's power. You can be sick and you say, Jesus. You can be almost suffocated. Can't breathe because the complications of COVID. But if it just say, Jesus. <laughs> Some people doubt because they want to doubt. Some people want to be the victim. That's why they don't want to say Jesus' name. They know the power is in the name. But some people's identity is in their struggle. Some people have an identity of always losing. But can I tell you something, baby? I can't lose when I use Jesus' name. If I say Jesus, you might as well. Oh, my God, that's the cheat code. I know y'all that play video games, y'all know the cheat code. And you know how to knock somebody out on Mortal Kombat. You know how to make a touchdown every time. I don't know the video game. Every time I play with a little kid, I lose. I want to fight him. 
But at the end of the day, baby, if you come at me with all of your mess, if you come at me with your lies, if you come at me with your vindi- with your vindiction, if you come at me in the wrong way, I know I got the cheat code, baby. And all I got to do is say, Jesus. When the devil comes at me like a flood, all I got to do is say, Jesus, I got the cheat code, baby. And every time I go through hell, every time I have a challenge, I just say, Jesus. If they knew the tomb was empty, why do they doubt? If they know Paul exists, why do they doubt? Because some folk think they smarter than God. They want to rationalize. Why did he have to do this? Because that's what he wanted to do. Your thoughts ain't his thoughts. Your ways not his ways. As far as heaven is from the earth, so is his ways from yours. Stop trying to think out, thank God, with your finite mind. We got all these denominations because somebody thought they knew. Methodists. They, they started it because they didn't agree with something else. Baptists. We... If you ain't getting put all the way in the water, you ain't made it. And John Smith, the, the, the founder of Baptist, they ain't never got baptized. It's funny. Let's keep it at 100. Sometimes I don't tell y'all the seminary stuff, but I had to tell you that one. You been under the water yet? If you ain't been under the water, you ain't right. They just do ring of you. And if you ain't almost drowned, you ain't saved. And then the pastor will get out of there 10 seconds or 4 seconds. <laughs> Cause if you ain't making the ten, I don't know. <laughs> but I knew it because I'm about this apology. So, you know. But at the end of the day, what I'm saying is stop trying to outthink God. Lean out on your own understanding and watch him take you to the next level in your life. Is there one? Is there one that wants to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Is there one? Is there one that wants to receive? Hello, I'm Pastor Willard Maxwell of New Beach Grove. And I just wanted to let you know, I believe that God is speaking directly to us through this ministry. And I believe that there may be some messages that you've missed that are life changing for you and you need to take the time to order. Or maybe there's some message that you heard that you know a friend or, or a coworker or a family member, even an enemy's life may be changed. And let me tell you this, in the Bible it says, don't stack up treasures here on earth that the moth will eat or the water will wash away. It says stack up your treasures in heaven where they, eat, where they will last for eternity. John says in my father's house there's many mansions. If it were not so I would have told you. What I'm telling you is this. The way you stack up your crown and build your mansions in heaven is when you give a life changing word to someone or share salvation. You don't have to be the one bringing the word. You can just buy the word and send it to someone and you're stacking up treasures in heaven. I'm believing that you're going to make the right decision and you're going to get this series or get a CD or get a DVD for somebody, it's going to be life changing. And instead of building up treasures here on earth, you're going to take the time to build up the treasures in eternity where you will live with your father forever. Be blessed. Hey, how you doing? I'm Willie Maxwell, a candidate for Newport News uh, City Council in North. I'm running because I want to continue to build relationships with organizations like the Police Foundation, like the police, like other organizations that help humanize and bring people together. Because I know a lot of times we're so divisive. Republicans don't like the Democrats just because they're Democrats. Democrats don't like the Republicans just because they're Republicans. But we're all people and we need to begin to serve our community. So I love partnering with the Police Foundation. I love partnering with Chief Drew and the police. I love partnering with the school system. So if you just continue to help me, help push me into office, I will continue to do the work that I'm already doing. But I'll be able to do it on a more on a higher and, and, and bigger scale to continue to help our community become the best community it can be. I need your help to get in the office. I need your donation. I need your support. I need you to volunteer. The way you can help me is, hey, let me know if, if we can put a sign in your yard. Let me know if you can help with, with social media and repost the things that we post. Let me know that you can give to friends of Willa Maxwell. The way you can give is on the screen. You can give through PayPal, Act Blue, or you can mail your checks to 359 Beachmont Drive. Newport News, Virginia, 23608. Again, we already partner, but if you help put me in the office, we'll be able to partner on a higher level and make sure we make Newport News the greatest city in the United States.
Hey, how you doing? I'm Pastor Maxwell, also the NAACP of Newport News president. And we just are feeding the 5,000 right now. Such a beautiful thing to have the NAACP and the SCLC working together. Both are historical organizations that were designed and founded to help people of color get through Jim Crow. But as you can see, certain things that happened on the Capitol, you can see people still want us to revert back to those days. That's why we continue to fight because evil never sleeps. King would say that all the time. We need to get more vigilant and we need to work as diligently and consistently and as passionately as those who do evil. So when people start that do good, work as hard as people that do evil, we'll be able to truly be free. So this is a great, great event. We thank Brother Andrew Shannon for bringing us on board for this. And we wanted to do something besides a parade because we didn't think, we didn't know how we would really be able to keep people social distance. So I know it's a great turnout, but to be safe, we had people drive by and grab the boxes as we um, had our gloves on and, and mask on and bibs on to make sure we kept everything COVID-19 compliant according to the CDC. And we were able to feed hundreds of people. So I believe that when you begin to give to God, God gives you a good measure blessing, press down, shaking together and running over and you can't beat God giving. And whenever you plant seeds in New Beach Grove or any kingdom minded church, you're planting good ground. And when you plant in good ground, the thing about the kingdom soil is this. If you plant apple seeds right here, you're gonna get apple seeds right here. But if you plant in New Beach Grove right here, your blessing may come up through your family, it may come up through a healing, it may come up through your business, it may come up somewhere else, but it will come up. So if you really wanna be blessed, continue to have a giving heart, especially my newbies Grovians, continue to give and help us to do things like feed the 5,000, to do things like free COVID-19 testing, continue to give to help us take care of the kids inside of the building because school is not going on in person because of COVID-19, but we wanna make sure we take care of those children that grow up with single mothers, grow up with single fathers, or even two working parents that can't be in two places at one time. They can't work and take care of them. So we have them housed in here, they're on the internet. We help them with Zoom. We have teachers here who are certified that get paid through this. We have Boys and Girls Club partner with us and we help pay them as well. And we always take care of the breakfasts. So thank you and we do a plethora of things in the, in, in the community and here. And however you can help us, help us. Because when you plant in this church, you're planting in good ground. We keep the homeless from 6.30 p.m. to 6 a.m. every single day, seven days a week for 17 weeks here at New Beach Grove. That's what we do. And so continue to support us, continue to plant seeds, and watch how God blesses your life.